Okay, thanks, John. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to talk about the um, natural history of quackery, obviously. And um, natural history is the old-fashioned term for science. It was the term that was used until the middle of the 19th century for all science. And so uh, that was kind of a fitting prelude to uh, this talk. Now, uh, no one uh, calls themselves a quack. And so uh, it's a, a derogatory term, but uh, I want to just talk a little bit about the origin of the word. It comes from old German, quacksalver. And in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's described as an ignorant pretender to skill, especially in medicine or surgery, or one who offers uh, wonderful remedies or devices. And the two words come from quacken, which kind of means to prattle or to quack, uh, you know, at a, a sideshow. And salve is a salve, an ointment. So someone who uh, pr uh, sells uh, ointments and medicines uh, at a sideshow. That's the fundamental origin of the, the term. Turn that light yeah. Okay, well, I'll have to, yes. Uh, it is very light, isn't it? I'm going to put this down. Yay. That's much Yay. better, isn't it? Yes, Thanks. yes. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So... Um, the origins of quackery really are very uh, ancient. The uh, principal doctor in history is Galen, who uh, practiced in Rome. He was a Greek physician, and he practiced in Rome at the time, uh, at the end of Christ's uh, lifetime. Uh, but he considers himself to be uh, a mainstream doctor. But he was involved with constant... Uh, arguments with various other sects in Rome, uh, and there are the names of them, and some of them will be familiar to you. The ra uh, Galen himself was a dogmatist. He believed in the humoral theory that uh, the body is made up of the four humors, and an imbalance of the four humors causes all disease. The rationalists believed that you could work out the origin of all diseases just by philosophical speculation. The empiricists were really like modern um, herbalists, shall we say, or naturopaths who uh, try something and find that it works and use that. They just used empirical methods. The methodics uh, had the idea that all disease was due to blockage of tubes in the body. They were very much into the pores on the skin being open or closed and allowing the evil humors to kind of go in and out. And the pneumatists believed that there was a thing called the pneuma, which you breathed in and out of your body, and that was the life spirit, uh, and that was the cause, an imbalance of that was the cause of all diseases. In the medieval period, um, conventional medicine was divided into two kind of broad groups of uh, treatment or diagnosis. Uh, one was the reliance on uroscopy or urinoscopy, where a patient was uh, sent a sample of urine to the doctor. Uh, the doctor held it up to the light uh, and made a diagnosis. And, uh, of course, this was open to uh, a lot of uh, abuse by uh, people that uh, thought this was a bit of a wag. And so they would send along horses' urine to the doctor, you know, and say, well, what's the matter with this? Or this, this, my mother, doctor, uh, and uh, all sorts of unusual diagnoses would come from that. But it was a well-established system of diagnosis. And the principal treatment was bleeding or venesection. And the idea, of course, was that the body was made up of the four humors and illness was all due to imbalance of the four humors. And so uh, if you had a preponderance of one humor or another, if you bled the person, then you evacuated that excess of humor. The same logic came by making the patient vomit or, um, uh, how shall I put it delicately, at the other end, go out at the other end as well. Uh, <clears throat> of course, doctors were only available to the elite because they were very expensive, and doctors had no interest at all in talking to the ordinary people who couldn't pay. And so the great majority of people relied on either folk medicine, which was folk medicine which was performed uh, in the home or by a friend or a local wise woman in the village, or uh, people that came around to the local fairs with 
various nostrums of their own. Nostrum comes from the, 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 the Latin hour thing, so it was our remedy, their own little remedy that fixed uh, individual illnesses or perhaps all sorts of illnesses. And these uh, people that came to the local fairs were really the origins of uh, the term quackery. Many of these people were, uh, frankly, charlatans. Uh, this is a painting by a Dutchman called Jan van Hemsen, uh, and it shows a, uh, an itinerant surgeon removing the stone of madness from a patient's skull. And so what the surgeon would do would be to uh, have a stone hidden in his hand, and he'd do a little bit of a fiddling thing around the uh, top of the head and uh, say, oh, there's the stone of madness. It's, I've just taken it out of your head. And so uh, there were all sorts of uh, quack kind of procedures pre uh, performed like that at village fairs. And that was the way that most people had their association with medicine. The 1700s, the 18th century, from 1700 to 1800, was what uh, really was a golden age of quackery and quack medicine. And it was due probably to the fact that people were becoming more sophisticated in terms of questioning uh, the values of society and morals, the, the whole movement called the Enlightenment, where there was no great movement in science or medical knowledge in the 1700s, but people um, were more willing to question things and to ridicule uh, uh, rather silly ideas. And so this was a very famous quack of the mid-1700s called Elisha Perkins, and he made a fortune uh, with his metallic extractors. So these were two metal bars, one made of brass and one of iron, and he put them onto the affected part, and these uh, tractors drew the illness out of the patient and cured them. And uh, James Gilray was one of several comic caricaturists who uh, made great fun of this kind of quackery. But Elisha Perkins made a great deal of money from it. Another caricaturist uh, was William Hogarth, and most of you will be familiar with the drawings of William Hogarth. He was an engraver of um, heraldic devices early on in his life. You know, he, he designed heraldic shields. Um, and then he uh, worked in Grub Street, which was the, uh, the journalistic uh, um, milieu in central London, and produced series of comic engravings, lampooning uh, everyone's uh, foibles. Uh, and of course, particularly the medical profession, and there are a lot of really nice uh, engravings that he did. This particular one is called The Company of Undertakers, and um, with tongue-in-cheek, he offered this as a heraldic device for the medical profession. <laughs> and what it shows at the bottom are 12 doctors who all look like rather unsavory characters. I don't think you'd really want any of those going near you. And they're all holding a cane. And the cane has a brass uh, or a golden uh, top uh, with little holes in it and uh, they would have aromatic herbs in that uh, gold-headed cane and they, when they went to see the patient so they didn't have to you know, be offended by the miasma coming off the uh, patient, probably rather disgusting, they just um, sniffed the herbs all the time. So that's, that's them. Now, these physicians, of course, were only interested in dealing with the wealthy. They weren't interested at all in uh, talking to ordinary people or poor people. But up the top, uh, he has three interesting quacks of the period. And um, on the left side is a man called Chevalier, excuse me, on the, on the left is a man called Chevalier John Taylor, on the, on the left over here. So Chevalier... John Taylor was an oculist. He uh, started off life as a footman and in various ways he learnt to 
treat eye diseases. And that's why uh, Hogarth has shown him with one eye closed, one eye here, and he's got one eye on his cane. Um, he developed, even though he had no medical training at all, he developed a technique called couching for the cataract, where you put a needle uh, into the uh, front of the eye and push the cataract back into the globe. And um, it is a reasonably successful uh, procedure in curing cataract, but unfortunately the secondary infection rate is unacceptably high, very high indeed. But he was uh, a very well-known quack, and uh, he made a lot of money. He rode around uh, London in a coach and four, and um, he treated Handel when uh, Handel was in London. The middle is Sarah Mapp, and Sarah Mapp was a bone setter, very famous bone setter. Um, and Hogarth has drawn her as being rather an ugly, cross-eyed woman. I, don't, I think she was a rather unprepossessing sort of character, but she was certainly extremely strong and very famous as a bone setter. Now, of course, a bone setter would have been a very important person in society. When you think of the number of fractures that come to the A&E department every weekend, um, you know, uh, fractures where the bones are at odd angles, someone had to set them. And the university physicians would have no idea how to set a fracture. Uh, so a pe person like Sarah Mapp, she called herself S uh, Crazy Sally for some reason. Uh, she was a very important individual. And again, she made a lot of money doing this. And she also uh, got around London in a coach and four. She had footmen and outriders um, and a very famous character. So. Instead of a cane, she's holding a uh, human bone, perhaps a femur. And the person on the right is yet another uh, famous quack of the mid-1700s called Spot Ward. Now, um, Joshua Ward made a fortune from what he called uh, Ward's Drops. They were, uh, it was a medicine made almost entirely of antimony. Now, antimony is a a chemical that has very similar properties to arsenic. Uh, it produces intense salivation, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, but it, uh, antimony was a very popular um, cure-all treatment uh, all throughout the Middle Ages. Um, anyway, uh, Joshua Spot Ward made uh, a great deal of money from that. Now, he was called Spot Ward because he had a big birthmark on one side of his face. So uh, uh, he's been rather cruelly uh, depicted here as uh, having half of his face um, in, in shade. He uh, again made a very large amount of money and um, he treated royalty. In fact, he uh, relocated George II's uh, dislocated thumb. And there's a very famous story about that, how uh, <coughs> the, uh, 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 a well-known physician of the time, uh, Cheselton, uh, had diagnosed gout in George II's thumb. And uh, Spot Ward, uh, being a fairly astute character, identified the fact that it was dislocated. So he gave the thing a, a quick wrench and relocated it. And for his trouble, George II kicked him in the shins. Uh, but he also gave him the right to drive his carriage through St. James's Park, which was a privilege only given to persons of quality, which Spot Ward certainly was not. But he, he, he confined his practice really to the nobility. And in fact, he, uh, his painting uh, here stand, uh, hangs in the Royal College of Surgeons in London. This is uh, Joshua Ward receiving money from Britannia and bestowing it on, bestowing it on as a charity on, to the needy. So he um, made a lot of money, but he also gave a lot to charity. He was really a very attractive character, a very flamboyant character, a great showman, of course, um, but, and very well known. And I think his uh, spot is probably represented on the other side of his face there. And that painting's from uh, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons in, in London by Thomas Bardwell. In fact, he also, this is him here, by the way, um, he's also got his statue in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So. Um, in addition to making a lot of money, he became a very famous character. There's no two ways about that. Now, uh, one of the most celebrated quacks of the uh, <clears throat> late 18, uh, 1700s, 18th century, was Dr. James Graham. 
Now, he was a conventional uh, medical graduate of Edinburgh, of all things, and he made his way to London to make his fortune. And uh, he set up in Pall Mall uh, the Temple of Health. And uh, this was a uh, kind of a health emporium, but it had a <coughs> very um, lewd and uh, kind of uh, overtones of sexuality. Uh, he started off by giving health lectures, and these, by all accounts, were extremely lewd in nature. But, of course, they attracted a great uh, following, of course. Uh, he also then uh, developed what he called the celestial bed in the Department of Health. And there are no pictures uh, extant of the celestial bed. So I've given you a drawing of it here. And let me describe it. So the idea was to improve uh, a couple's uh, sexual uh, function and uh, satisfaction. Uh, it cost 50 pounds a night, which was a very large amount of money at the time. It was about maybe three, three and a half thousand pounds or so in this money. So uh, here were the couple in bed. It was 12 feet by 6 feet. Um, there were um, signs above it saying be fruitful and multiply. There were live turtle doves uh, suspended in cages above the bed. Underneath the bed there were 100 lodestones which had been magnetized, and the fundamental treatment was magnetic therapy. Uh, there were also uh, glass, vertical glass rods around the outside, and the lodestones were magnetized by a um, mechanical laden, laden uh, flask um, electrostatic machine, which you can see at the bottom there, which was worked by someone underneath the bed. Uh, there were also musicians on hand to provide celestial music for the encouragement of the copulating couple. Uh, there were also fragrant um, herbs burnt, and so that there was a miasma of, of fragrant herbs all the way through there. And finally, um, in order to improve the chance of the lady becoming pregnant, uh, there was a crank device that tilted the foot of the bed upwards, uh, which is kind of the optimal position for um, fertilization, but we won't go into that. <laughs> the other aspect of the uh, Temple of Health was that he offered mud baths, and mud baths he considered were to be the ideal treatment uh, of choice. Um, and in order to attract customers, he had various young women that were employed to go into the mud baths and kind of demonstrate the technique and sort of encourage other people to come in. The reason I bring this up is that one of them, one of the young women involved was Emma Hamilton. Now, Emma Hamilton was um, the mistress of um, Lord Nelson, and she had a very interesting uh, uh, career. Uh, she was an orphan, made her way to London, she went into service. Uh, by the age of 12, she was a, a servant in, in a household in London. When she was 15, she was taken on as uh, the mistress of a nobleman. Uh, but by the age of 16, she had been rejected by that nobleman and she found employment as a dancer and kind of a, um, a a young woman with no clothes on uh, in, in and out of the mud baths in this uh, celestial uh, temple of health. Um, subsequently, she managed to get herself married to Sir William Hamilton, who became the governor of Naples. And that's where Nelson, uh, in the, his victory, uh, put into Naples for resupply and uh, was entertained by uh, the governor and uh, met Emma and... That was that, and so he, she became his mistress. So that's just an interesting association. James Graham, actually, he went bankrupt eventually. Uh, this uh, temple, the, the celestial bed, crippled him financially, and uh, he was eventually ruined. But uh, <clears throat> because it was all associated with the um, uh, use of magnetism, uh, the... the uh, caricaturists in London had a field day, of course, and um, so here is a caricature of uh, Graham, 
And down here, he's got um, what is referred to as the largest prime conductor in the world. Uh, and it also says down here, it's a gentle restorer. Uh, and um, over here are Gog and Magog. There were two gigantic uh, bouncers at the door. It was all a uh, commercial enterprise. But you can see there are all sorts of other kind of phallic symbols around the place, cannon shooting and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and here was one of his great um, rivals, a, a German called Catafeltro, who set up a very similar thing in opposition. And um, if I just read up the top, you can't read that, but I'll read it to you. Uh, what he's saying here, he's pointing to the largest prime conductor in the world, and he's talking about that round vigor, that full-tone juvenile virility that speaks so cordially and so effectively home to the female heart, conciliating its favor and friendship and riveting its uh, intensest affections. So he made a lot of money doing that, that's for sure. Well, if you are interested in uh, magnetism and the bed, uh, you can still get this because there is a thing called the Biomag, uh, magnetic underlay, uh, which is heavily advertised by uh, Murray Deeker and um, uh, so the Tui Gamala, that um, rugby what's his name now? Forgotten? Vainga Tui Gamala, that's right. And uh, that's Buck Shelford there. Uh, so, and um, a comely young woman advertising it as well. And this apparently gives uh, magnetic vibrations, which are really very good for your bed. Well, the idea of magnetism and the uh, benefits of magnetization were uh, continued by uh, Franz Anton Mesmer, who uh, gives his name to the term mesmerism. And uh, Mesmer started his career, uh, he was again a conventional doctor uh, in uh, Vienna. Uh, he had the idea that, the, um, that there is a thing called animal magnetism. He, here's the picture, the word down here, animal magnetism. He had the idea that animal magnetism was kind of like the ether which uh, permeated the entire world and permeated human bodies as well. It would seem that Mesmer, uh, not exactly was a quack, but he, he really believed that um, this was the way the world was. And he uh, believed that he had the ability to either draw out or put in uh, excess or provide, you know, uh, bolster deficiencies in the um, the uh, animal magnetism in patients. Um, when he got to Paris, he uh, developed a salon, and the essence of the salon was this round tub. And the tub had uh, multiple magnetized lodestones in it, and there were um, metallic conductors coming out of the tub, and people sat around and held on to the tub and got uh, energized by the animal magnetism. And uh, here in the corner is a woman swooning. Uh, <clears throat> after a while, it became apparent that there were a great many women uh, attracted to this um, uh, salon, and that a great many of them were having fits of the vapors and swooning uh, as a result of this. And so the word got around that it, it was all a rather unseemly, unsavory kind of uh, thing, that women were being led astray and that they're finer emotions were being played with and, um, uh, you know, there are all these sorts of overtones. And so uh, a, a um, council from the uh, Paris medical faculty was put together to investigate him. And on the faculty was uh, Antoine Lavoisier, who was uh, one of the discoverers of oxygen, and also Benjamin Franklin, who happened to be in, Amer in Paris at the time as a representative of the uh, newly emerging, emerging American states. And so they um, <clears throat> formed a committee and uh, they decided that uh, Mesmer's uh, arrangement was uh, just quackery and he was drummed out of town. But he gives his name to the, the term mesmerism. Well, by the time we got to the beginning of the 1800s, the 19th century, uh, electricity was all the rage. And um, so electricity uh, really dominates medical quackery all through the 1800s, from 1800 to 1900. 
And um, there were an enormous range of uh, electrical devices that were uh, marketed, particularly in the United States. And they were generally uh, designed for the treatment of what was considered to be nervous exhaustion or nerves or neurasthenia. Neurasthenia was the, the great term for this. And uh, one of the main manufacturers was Pulvermacher, who produced things called electrical belts. And uh, they had uh, testimonials from uh, many eminent people. Uh, and here is a, an advertisement for the uh, belt. And so if I read this uh, advertisement on the left, you see it uh, refers to vigorous manhood. Uh, would you believe it that these two men are the same age? One is 50 and one is 30, but can you pick which one it is? I bet you can't. So uh, one of them, uh, the older one, uh, is wearing an electrical belt. And if I just read what is uh, on there, on the right-hand side, it says, Young man, you have exceeded the limit allowed by nature in the enjoyment of worldly pleasures. You have at some time overtaxed your nervous system and there is a weakness lurking there ready to break forth in all its pitiable, destructive effects upon you. Do not disregard these little symptoms which you may feel from day to day. There are messages telling you you are suffering from your nerves and warning you that a breakdown is near. It may come tomorrow, but then it will be too late to mend. So the treatment, of course, is to wear the electrical belt. And so there is the belt. It's got electrical pads at the back. And I think uh, Mr. Wrigley is put through the middle of that hole there, and the whole thing is uh, plugged into the mains and you're away. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. A Albert Abrams was probably the most famous uh, electrical quack in the United States. He was, um, a, again, a physician, and he was a, uh, we claimed he was a neurologist at least in San Francisco, and he uh, developed and uh, marketed uh, various machines uh, which were called variously the os oscilloclass, the dynamizer, and the reflexophone. And here he is at the bottom here with one of these machines, and he's got a uh, metallic uh, rod uh, against this man's belly, and the idea was that the oscilloclass could identify the electrical vibrations that were given out by each uh, illness of a patient. And e equally, you then use another machine, the dynamizer, to reverse the procedure. You diagnosed the illness through one channel of the, uh, the wand, and then you could send back sympathetic electrical impulses into the body to cure the disease. It was really quite wonderful. Well, another variation of that was uh, a device called uh, the uh, a device producing violet rays by the Virex Electrical Company, and this picture here was given to me by my colleague, Dr. David Jones, who um, gave me this picture, and he's got a uh, uh, an example of the machine, which uh, I think he's going to show at the the very end. So we'll look forward to that, David. Well, uh, there are any number of electrical devices. Uh, and some of them were extremely weird and wonderful, uh, as this one, which was uh, a cure for baldness, uh, called the Thermocap, <coughs> called the Thermocap, and um, the interesting thing about it is that it was marketed by the Merck Company, and the Merck Company was the um, forerunner of the large drug house called Merck Sharp and Dome. Well, Dome, I suppose they got the Dome <laughs> bit from uh, that bit. Anyway, um, I'm sure that it uh, helped that man's baldness. Well, now, this is a really sad story. So uh, just uh, bear with me. If I read this, it says, this, she was a one-date girl. Most of her engagements were blind dates. It's very sad. Later, these men found excuses uh, when her name was brought up. Somehow she never seemed to click. They thought she was dull, when really she was constantly tired. She had a good figure, had natural lovely skin, but pimples marred its surface. Her eyes lacked the liveliness of a girl in good health, so night after night she sat by the phone and waited for calls that never came. It's so sad, really. She might have been a different girl if she had only known about the importance of regular habits. 
Uh, and the, the harm that constipation can do, this condition may cause headaches and loss of appetite. Wrinkles and pimples may appear. <laughs> Heavens. Well, this was an advertisement for Kellogg's, you can see down there. <laughs> and um, so let me talk a little bit about John Harvey Kellogg. Uh, and John Harvey Kellogg was, of course, the uh, forerunner of the Kellogg um, uh, cereal empire. So he was a conventionally uh, qualified doctor again but he was intensely interested in um, nutrition. And uh, he set up uh, a sanatorium in Battle Creek, Michigan. And in the sanatorium, people were uh, put on diets. Uh, they had various forms of massage and exercise performed upon them. But the other thing that he was intensely interested in was colonic cleanliness. He was very heavily into enemas. And so, uh, the patients in the um, sanatorium spent a great deal of time having their colon cleansed. Not only that, but they were given enemas of yogurt. And the idea was to repopulate their colon. I'm sure Gil Barbazat will realize the value of this uh, by repopulating the uh, flora and fauna of the colon with yogurt up the patient's tail end. Well, that was Harvey Kellogg. Uh, Kellogg. The, uh, the uh, business was developed by his brother, William Kellogg, and uh, they were all Seventh-day Adventists. So uh, that's another part of the story because the name uh, sanitarium was taken over by the Seventh-day Adventist church, and <clears throat> the sanitarium uh, empire is all heavily uh, uh, dominated by people of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, when I was in Australia, I knew some of them, and the only people they employed in their factories and warehouses and so on were, were Seventh-day Adventists. So it's all very heavily Seventh-day Adventist uh, influenced. Well, uh, he was also um, interested in other forms of therapy, and um, in, in addition to, to, to diet. Um, so uh, in Battle Creek uh, factory, they also produced a, a variety of electrical devices, like um, things for massaging your head. You could massage your eyeballs. That was a really good thing if you had a bit of weak vision here. There was a health jolting chair, which was also developed by the Kellogg uh, Company in Battle Creek, Michigan. They were also into hydrotherapy. And so um, he wrote a book here called Rational Hydrotherapy. Uh, so here is here and having a bucket of water chucked over the man. I mean, that's a really good thing to have done, I'm sure. Um, the name is a bit intriguing. It's called Rational Hydrotherapy. But uh, here also from his book are two other forms of therapy where he's got someone in the bath and the whole thing is plugged up to, the, to an electrical supply. <laughs> and this man with his feet in water is all wired up as well, which doesn't strike me as particularly um, rational hydrotherapy at all, really highly dangerous, I would have thought. Well, <clears throat> another aspect to uh, dietary health was the use of radium. And with the discovery of, of uh, radiation, uh, radium was considered to be a very important cure-all. And so what happened was that these uh, containers were heavily impregnated with radioactive minerals. You uh, put water in them and let them soak overnight and drank the water in the morning very radioactive, of course. The reason I put that up with the picture on the left side, on the other side, is that <clears throat> that is a picture of uh, an antimony cup which Captain Cook took with him on the resolution on his voyages of discovery to Australia and New Zealand, and it's now in the Greenwich Maritime Museum. Now, <clears throat> the reason I put that up is that I mentioned antimony before as a cure-all, very popular in the Middle Ages. Well, one of the ways in which people took antimony was to have an antimony cup. It was made of antimony, or at least heavily impregnated with antimony, and you put wine into the cup uh, uh, at night, and overnight the antimony leached into the wine and you drank the cup in the morning. And that was a standard treatment. Of course, it produced salivation and vomiting and diarrhea, but that purgation was considered to be a very good thing in evacuating the humours. So that was the antimony cup that was taken by James Cook on his, his voyages of discovery. 
Well, um, if you need a little jazz or a little zing in your sex life, you could also have radioactive <laughs> condoms. And I'm sure that put a little spark in things. Um, the final thing before I leave this topic is that uh, some of you may wonder or be con worried about whether the word anal retentive should be uh, hyphenated or not. I mean, uh, you may be a bit obsessed by that. Uh, and that might be the riddle of the Sphinx. Now, uh, here is uh, <coughs> Oedipus, and one of the tasks that Oedipus had to do was to understand uh, the riddles presented by the Sphinx. And if he'd got them wrong, then he was to be killed. And how was he to be killed? You guessed it. The Sphinx throttled him, see? So that's the, I the origin of the word uh, sphincter when you throttle someone or contract them. And sphygmomanometer all comes from that word sphinx as well. So sphincter. Well, you may not have realized it, but um, there are a great many disorders associated with spasm of the rectal sphincter. And you probably didn't realize that you could have pain between the shoulders, sacroiliac trouble, dysmenorrhea, sciatica, headaches, all from um, spasm of the anal sphincter. And, of course, the cure for that was to use rectal dilators, which were marketed for your, for your benefit. Well, <clears throat> in the um, latter part of the uh, 19th century, uh, various uh, kind of schools of medical thought developed, and the first one was osteopathy, uh, developed by uh, a man called uh, Andrew Taylor Still. And he developed the idea that all illness was due to interference with the blood supply flowing into the body by, caused by pressure from displaced bones. That was the general idea. But by 1925, uh, people in studying osteopathy in the osteopathic colleges were learning conventional medicine, they were learning surgery, and now uh, doctors of osteopathy are virtually indistinguishable from MDs. Uh, there are a very large number of osteopathic hospitals in the United States uh, populated by doctors of osteopathy, and the school curriculum, medical school curriculum, is virtually identical to conventional medical schools. In fact, I believe they're fully registerable in the American Medical Association, uh, and certainly uh, they treat patients in ex almost exactly the same way. So they really don't believe much anymore, as far as I understand, with this original theory of um, interference with blood flow. However, the skeleton in the cupboard of osteopathy was a, a spin-off called chiropractic. And uh, chiropractic was begun by a man called, uh, here, David Palmer. And uh, he, again, had the idea that all diseases were due to uh, malalignment of bones, but particularly malalignment of the skeleton. And so he uh, treated all illnesses by manipulation of the spine, basically, not other parts of the body. And um, I, my understanding is that chiropractors still fundamentally hold this view that uh, all diseases, or most diseases at least, are coming from malalignments of the spine, which can be uh, uh, realigned uh, by manipulation. Well, uh, another important uh, alternative medical theory was homeopathy, developed by Samuel Hahnemann uh, in the late 1700s. And whereas conventional medicine uses uh, drugs which counteract symptoms, that's called allopathic medicine, uh, he had the idea that uh, substances which produced symptoms in a healthy person would produce the same symptoms and cure uh, the same symptoms in a sick person. You may not follow the logic of that, but that is the idea. And um, it was called homeopathy rather than homopathy because homoios in Greek means similar, but not exactly like. And um, so the idea was that you took a medication and you diluted it many, many times, up to a thousand times, and um, uh, gave it to the patient, that would produce symptoms which would then alleviate the problem. And if I can do this, I am going to show you a 
video if I can make this thing work. This is a homeopathic A&E, and I believe it's true. One pint in a million. I'm sure it looks serious. You're right. You need to strengthen the dose. One pint in ten million. Only drop down. Really good. Check your one. That's what we can't handle. Get me some wolf's bane, also known as monk's food in here. And a whole tray of flower remedies. Oh, the chakras are fading. We need some crystals. That's fresh some purple tinted quartz. Dang it, you're right. Make that aquamarine quartz. Cool. Okay, he's stabilizing. Now, does anybody know what sort of car hit him? Blue Form One Day, apparently. Right, get me a bit of Blue Form One Day. Put it in water, shake it, dilute it, shake it again, dilute it again, do some more shaking, dilute it some more, and then put three drops on his tongue. If that doesn't cure him, I don't know what will. What is that? What is this? What is it? Dizzy, this poor chap's got long to live. Why not? His lifeline is short. <laughs> his horoscope's not too clever either. Sagittarius, brace yourself for a surprise. What? What's your challenge for you? So we are, unless... Wait. What? We could try drawing a bit more lifeline on with Byron. <laughs> no better idea. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Time of death, 3.34. Ish. I just can't stand losing them. It happens. I don't know. Sometimes I think a trace solution of deadly nightshade or a statistically negligible quantity of arsenic just isn't enough. <laughs> That's crazy talk, Simon. Okay, so you kill the odd patient with cancer or heart disease, or bronchitis, flu, chickenpox, or measles. But when someone comes in with a vague sense of unease, or a touch of the nerves, or even just more money than sense, they'll be there for the bottle of basically just water in one hand and a huge invoice in the other. I suppose you're right. I am. Another drink. I need one. Excuse me. Two more homeopathic lockers, please. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I enjoy all kinds of food these days. Now I have to uh, take that off because I have to. I have mucked this up. Just excuse me. There we go. Don't want him on. Yeah. I'm learning how to drive this. Okay. So um, <coughs> I want to introduce you to the idea of naturopathy. Um, my understanding of naturopathy is that it is a spectrum of uh, remedies which are uh, designed to improve the health and treat disease by assisting the body's natural processes. And there are a whole range of uh, <clears throat> remedies or, or theories that are under the rubric of natura naturopathy, herbalism, homeopathy, massage hydrotherapy, Indian medicine, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and natural birthing. But the interesting thing about them is that really they can all be considered to be reinvention of the uh, ideas of Hippocrates because Hippocrates' fundamental idea was that nature is the healer of all disease. And in fact, the Greek uh, root of the word physician is nature. And so um, <clears throat> one view, a cynical view uh, put forward by Voltaire is that the fun fundamental um, uh, use of medicine is to kind of keep the patient occupied, entertained, while nature uh, heals the disorder. Now here's a just, I'm sorry to give you so many very sad stories, this is a really sad one. Now this <coughs> is in the midst of uh, one of the most brilliant social functions of the season, a noted society woman started suddenly from her chair with a scream of agony and fell insensible to the floor. And a few hours later the distinguished physician told her anxious husband she was suffering from an acute case of nervous prostration brought on by female trouble and hinted at an operation. Fortunately, a friend advised her to try Lydia Pinkham's herbal remedy. The result 
was that she escaped the surgeon's knife. And today she's a well woman. Isn't that a wonderful story? I think it is, really. Now, uh, some of you that are older uh, in this audience might remember in 1968 a, a comic song by a group called The Scaffold. And it went like that. We'll drink a drink a drink to Lily the Pink, the Pink, the Pink, the saviour of the human race. She invented medicinal compounds. I won't sing it to you, but it went like that, most efficacious in every way. That was very popular in 1968. Well, Lydia Pinkham again made a fortune from her remedy. Uh, and Lydia, there, he, there she is, Lydia Pinkham. Uh, the um, thing has been analysed. It really has got those ingredients but you can still buy Lydia Pinkham's mixture. Um, it was targeted at women, and again I have to read uh, some of this uh, up to you. It says here, it will cure entirely the worst forms of female complaints, all ovarian troubles, inflammation, ulceration, falling and displacement of the womb, and consequently spinal weakness are particularly adapted to the change of life. Um, and so on. And nervous prostration, general debility, sleeplessness, depression, and so on. Down the bottom it says it will cure scrofula, rheumatism, cancerous humor, erysipelas, canker, salt rheumatism, and, and, um, and skin diseases. And of course hysteria. So hysterical women were, uh, should be treated with it as well. Um, now another group of uh, remedies that were extremely popular were Carter's Little Liver Pills and Beecham's Pills or Beecham's Powders. Uh, throughout medical history, the liver has been considered to be a site of illness without any great logic to it. But people were described as liverish or lily-livered or weak-livered or so on. And um, biliousness and upset of the liver was considered to be um, uh, a dire illness. So Carter's little liver pills were particularly popular. Uh, you can still buy them, and that's what they were made of at the bottom there. Podophyllin, uh, aloes, licorice, acacia, and wheat starch. And Beecham's pills, or Beecham's powders, again, uh, were made of all these things. Ginger, there was soap in, in them, uh, as well as aloes and rosemary oil and so on. Now, Beecham's was the uh, forerunner of Beecham's laboratories, and uh, they're now a very large uh, commercial enterprise. You could buy Beecham's pills until 1977, when it was gradually uh, phased out. Well, uh, you'll realize, of course, men, that it's no funny fun having a, a wife with nerves. <laughs> and uh, nerves, of course, are the, what are the worst things you can be afflicted with. But if you take Dr. Nervine's, uh, Dr. Miles's Nervine pills, then you'll be fixed. Uh, of course, targeting, targeting the female audience, uh, you can have uh, various sorts of soap, which will wash away fat, or various uh, chemicals and uh, drugs that will burn fat and get rid of that. Uh, I just want to turn for a moment now to uh, <clears throat> the uh, concept of faith healing and, and religious uh, involvement with medicine. <coughs> and um, one of the most famous uh, faith healers was Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of the Church of Christ Scientist, um, also called the Christian Science Movement. Um, and. Um, she was a very unusual uh, woman who was uh, afflicted with uh, a variety of um, indeterminate illnesses early in her life, and she decided that um, all, all illness was caused by um, a lack of faith, a lack of faith in Jesus Christ, to be specific, and that the cure for all illnesses was um, to become converted to Christianity and to... to uh, lead a, a life of faith. And that's why she set up the Church of Christ Scientist. And the fundamental principle is that uh, <clears throat> there is no such thing as disease per se. It's just a lack of Christian faith. And so if you have Christian faith, then you will uh, be cured. And of course, there are many Christian science reading rooms. And here's the one in Dunedin that's in Murray Place, just opposite the St. John's Ambulance, um, which you can go and read there. It's big business in the United States. This is down the bottom. That's the uh, f um, uh, home church of uh, the Christian scientists in, in Boston. Uh, it's a palatial affair, so there's a lot of money involved with that. Another um, organization kind of peripherally involved with faith healing is Scientology. And Scientology was developed by a man 
called L. Ron Hubbard. And Ron Hubbard was a writer of uh, science fiction novels. And he gradually got interested in the uh, idea of the uh, disorders of the human mind. And uh, he developed a theory called Dianetics. And Dianetics was uh, the science of identifying worrying thoughts that individual people have. And these worrying thoughts that you have are called engrams. And the engrams can be identified by using a thing called an e-meter. And the e-meter is operated by a person who is trained by the Church of Scientology called an auditor. So the idea is that if you kind of get hooked by one of these people, the auditor will use the e-meter on you and diagnose the various disorders that you have in your mind and treat you. Well, of course, there are very many uh, famous people that are involved with Scientology. There's Tom Cruise, uh, John Travolta, uh, Kirstie Alley, and a few others. Well, uh, there are many, many other uh, kind of uh, peripheral uh, uh, beliefs uh, as to the cause of medicine. I'll just give you two more of them here. One of them is reflexology, which seems to be one of the more bizarre. The idea is that uh, all parts of the body are represented on the sole of the foot. And so if you have um, disorder of the paranasal cavity of the side of your nose, if you massage the tips of the toes, that will cure it. Uh, if you have a problem with the shoulder, that's where you uh, get massaged here, or the right ear, or the left ear, and so on. Uh, every part of the body is represented on the foot. Another is Reiki, and Reiki is the idea that everyone has an aura about them. And if you are a particularly sensitive person, you can see the aura kind of emanating like a halo, like a saint's halo around the head. And again, if you're a gifted individual, you can lay on hands and you can... Uh, manipulate the aura and cure them. So that's a good thing as well. Um, now, much of this uh, um, interest in peripheral uh, alternative medicine, I think, developed in the 1960s in the counterculture and the beginning of what's called po postmodernism. Postmodernism is a, a concept very uh, much beloved by literary uh, uh, academics. The idea that everything is relative, there is no absolute. Uh, you know, people's beliefs are just relative to other people's beliefs. There is no absolute in anything. That's the whole idea of postmodernism. Well, the counterculture was associated with the anti-war movement, dissatisfaction with uh, Vietnam War, uh, a reaction to the greedy, soulless uh, uh, view of society and modernity, an idea of living a healthy lifestyle. Uh, giving value to marginalized uh, people and minority groups. And then in 1979, the Surgeon General in the United States uh, announced that half of all deaths in the United States were due to unhealthy uh, lifestyle. And so that inaugurated the great interest in preventative medicine and, and health promotion. Well, this movement now is called CAM, Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and it is big business. In the UK, in 2010, uh, there were six, five billion pounds spent on uh, CAM, complementary and alternative medicines, uh, which had increased dramatically over the last 10 years. And there were more CAM practitioners in the UK than there were GPs. And of course, they have some very high profile adherents, like Prince Charles, who's a great enthusiast of complementary and alternative medicines. And in the United States, of course, it again is validated there is a, uh, an Office of Alternative Medicine in the United States National Institutes of Health, and there is a National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicines as well. Well, there's no doubt that advertising works, and um, uh, it certainly attracts people, and most um, peripheral and alternative medicines uh, rely heavily on advertising. And here I've just pulled off the website uh, something from the Omaru Pharmacy. And uh, this young woman is, is uh, Dr. Libby. And in fact, it's, uh, her name is Libby Weaver, and she's, not a, she's sort of a doctor. She's uh, got a PhD in nutrition from the University of Newcastle. Anyway, she's a great believer in uh, magnesium. And down here it says that uh, magnesium is required for various bodily functions. And so it's particularly benefit, beneficial in all sorts of uh, ways. 
So you can use magnesium body lotions, magnesium bath flakes, um, and so on. Um, there's also the, the um, well-known product called Arthrem uh, that is, appears on my television every night, um, telling me that if I use Arthrem, I can get back on my farm. Uh, and that seems to be a good thing as well. So advertising is a very important part of all of this. Well, uh, before we uh, laugh at all this, um, who has not fallen victim to uh, that dreadful psychological disorder called love? And uh, who has not made a fool of themselves in uh, that regard? It's only one field of human credulity. Money, of course, the whole stock market is driven by uh, uh, human emotion. Uh, there's not a great deal of logic behind it. Medicine, religion, love, they all rely on uh, a play on human emotion, a weakness and fear. And um, one of the uh, great entrepreneurs of the 19th century was, was uh, P.T. Barnum, who uh, started off Barnum and Bailey Circus, but he was a great entrepreneur. And he was the origin of the term, or the, the saying, which everyone knows, there's a sucker born every minute. And uh, the other uh, quotation that I particularly like from P.T. Barnum is down the bottom. Every crowd has a silver lining. I kind of like that. <laughs> there's always money to be made somewhere. If there's a crowd, you get a few mugs and you could fleece them for sure. Okay, well, this is uh, my, my wind-up slide, really. Um, in the... Uh, <clears throat> late 1700s, early uh, 1800s, there was a, a philosopher and mathematician, a very smart mathematician called Blaise Pascal. That's him here. And he pondered whether or not it was logical to believe in God. Now, my understanding is that most philosophers now believe you cannot prove that God exists. So Pascal uh, came to that conclusion as well. And he said, OK, well, let's uh, look at this table. If you don't believe in God and you're an atheist um, and you're wrong and God does exist, well, then she'll come after you and you'll be done. That's for sure. So there's internal, eternal suffering. If you don't believe in God and you're right and there is no God, well, then there's nothing. If you do believe in God and there is no God, again, there's nothing. But if you do believe in God and there is a God and you're right, you're home and hosed, you see. You're, you're, uh, you've got eternal joy. So the only choice, really, is between either eternal joy or eternal suffering. Which one would you choose? Well, obviously eternal joy. So the idea is, and I think this applies to alternative medicines as well, what the hell? Give it a try. What have you got to lose? I mean, you're only going to lose some money. Uh, and if, you, if it works, well, that's great. Well, there is a, a concept in, in English law, uh, mainly uh, associated with property transactions, called caveat emptor. Means, oh, there's a lawyer in, in, the, in the audience. I <laughs> uh, just noticed. They have to correct me if I'm wrong here. The idea is that if you're selling a property, you don't have to divulge any unflattering facts about the property. If the, le if the roof leaks and the drains are blocked, uh, then, uh, and the buyer finds that out, well, too bad. They should have been aware. That, I gather, has been somewhat superseded by various consumer rights protection acts, but the fundamental principle still applies, I think, that the buyer should be aware in terms of looking at alternative medicines. So that's my take on uh, the history of quackery and alternative medicines. Thank you very much indeed. Any questions, comments? I have one of those electric bells at home. Have you? That doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably not. Well, <laughs> I was going to say you. Uh, oh, I won't say it. <clears throat> David, come come up and show this box, please. Psychic surgeon about three decades ago. People went through those roads. Yes, I do. That's right. That's right. David's got, if anyone's got uh, time to wait, David has got um, that, uh, a, a box. What do you call that, that machine, David? It's a very dangerous 
Yes, yes. Um, anyone else got any comments about this uh, thing? What we're looking at is this gadget here. Um, that. And, uh, oh, sorry. There, that's it. So tell us about it, David. Well, first of all, I'll just mention that you, you related relatively uh, people who have only tricked the rich. The man who gave him this was a uh, former water slider at uh, Port Chalmers and a taxi driver with a great intellect and a great man to drive with. But uh, he didn't know what it was, and for many years I didn't, and it sat around until uh, Eddie dropped. And uh, I looked up the name of a I looked I look up the name of the device on the internet and led, led me into understanding that this is called uh, Violetta Therapy. And so all my files are covered, right? <laughs> and it's been used for everything in about the mid-1950s. It was banned in the United States because of um, uh, false advertising about being able to cure everything, as uh, the talk's been about. Uh, however, I looked this week on the internet, I could buy one of these for quite a low price from Hong Kong, probably wouldn't uh, blow up like this one, and it also is uh, built to treat just about everything, but it does say in a little caveat at the bottom, it's illegal in the United States, and I'll check where you're trying to buy it from, and I'll see one of it, and buy it from there. So just, just look up on eBay, um, Violetta Therapy, and you'll find a, a modern one if you want to try it. <laughs> Yeah, of course, yes. yeah, thanks, Jerry. That's fascinating. Can I just ask, um, presumably we've evolved, medicine, current medicine has evolved from qu quackery, um, but in terms of homeopathy, what's, what do you think has happened over the last 20, 30, 50 years in, with homeopathy taking on science and, uh, and obviously a large number of randomised trials now involving homeopathy? I'm not really qualified to answer that question. Other people may be. My understanding is that homeopathy is still very strong, but perhaps someone with more knowledge about the science of it or the uh, the way in which it's been tested would be best to answer. Barry, you presumably know of some trials. Oh, there's a there's a there's there's a lot of trials, um, and some of them show effect. A lot of them don't show an effect. And I just wonder what happens in the contrast between uh, the results from scientific endeavour versus belief and the clash that occurs when that happens and, and what therefore would evolve. Presumably something evolves. Yes, indeed. Anyone got a comment on that? Um, I don't know a lot about homeopathy, but um, my understanding would be that homeopaths will point to the trials that they like and the, some trials are more have better methodology than others. So depending on how, where you set your bar for methodology in your, in your systematic review, you can, you can make a systematic review that looks positive, perhaps. And then there are some technology assessment reviews in some of the Germanic countries, looking not so much at the um, RCT effectiveness, but at you know, how, how useful is this in our society as a treatment? And some of those come up with quite positive uh, recommendations that this is a useful treatment because it's relatively cheap and um, doesn't cause too much harm and people seem to get better. So that's an argument which is which is used quite um, quite a lot in, in other countries who have a slightly different way of looking at it. There was a trial in the UK that found that GPs use homeopathy and other alternative medicines actually describe fewer painkillers. David, I know as a pain therapist you have told me that you believe that some psychic manipulations are effective in pain relief? Was that? A, a, a professional clinical psychologist would use a lot of uh, cognitive measures to help people deal with their pain, not focus on it. I don't think it 
really says it goes away. They don't let it rule their life as much, so that their cognitive behavioural methods is many different types, mindfulness and the like. But, but that's the, the, the professional's application, not a quack practitioner who's got a string of uh, qualifications that actually really they bought online. One of the problems with the classic homeopathic trials, apparently, is that it's almost impossible to have a placebo group because each patient is an N equals one, they're individual, and the, the therapy is tailored to that individual. And in the end, although for a lot of patients it doesn't make any difference, it is a placebo in which they believe, but you have to have the caveat that is that a disease that could be treated more effectively by a proper recognized medical treatment and then the consequences of not treating that disorder. The question earlier of homeopathy, when it was introduced, the majority of medical problems related to people eating unwholesome food. There's no refrigerator, refrigerator standard, etc. And a very like a sub-therapeutic <coughs> dose of the laxative would clear that unwholesome material and you know yield positive results. Now from there it's been generalized to all illnesses, but homeopathy would have had a positive um, you know press at that time compared to um, like when a person got diarrhea because of unwholesome food. If using the such a complementary and uh, alternative medicine which has sprung up in the West from the 1980s onwards, there may be lots of explanation. I'm going to venture one. Between 1975 and 1979 there was a Royal Commission on the National Health Service. It was chaired by a physicist, Alexander Merriman, and it's not just British eccentricity that a physicist did it. You know, physicists come up with very reliable um, conclusions. <coughs> a lot of the conclusions relating to medical tr medicines, I mean, there, there's lots in the National uh, in the Royal Commission, but the medicines one. Now, the pharmacy profession and the medical profession have not really followed through on it, but other industries have, have sprung up. Uh, that's my, you know, like, it's not as if the West went backwards. Um, yes. it, some, yeah, that, that's my explanation. Sure. What else? Comments? Is it true? But people who go to see the local GP, 60% get better in a week without going to see him. The rest get better in four weeks without going to see him, and the rest don't know they're sick. Joe, a <laughs> GP, you <laughs> answer that for yes, I, I, I think I didn't quite hear your figures, but it's something along that way. I was just thinking, I often have patients who I send for an x-ray, and the x-ray is normal and they get better. The, the problem they've had for ages just, just goes away. So that Do you know, radiation. as a radiologist, uh, I sit and wade through these piles of lumbar spine x-rays and I think exactly the same thing that the GPs just flick them off to have an x-ray uh, it's of almost no use at all and in the week uh, you know that patient gets better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Except you might as well go to the clap. More or less, yeah. <laughs> Certainly lumbar spine x-rays are complete but not a waste of time in low back pain. Perhaps it's the x-ray that's curious. Oh, well maybe it is. It sort of cleans up all the bugs. Absolutely, yeah. That's the question. Um, there must be two distinct groups of people here. People who really believe in that Yes. Well, I don't know how to distinguish the people that truly believe in their therapy and those that are trying to scam money. I don't know. Do you have a way of distinguishing that? <laughs> Does anyone? <laughs> 